I will say uh, thank you for having me, and this is a, about my fifth or sixth opportunity to talk about this, and I enjoy these sessions quite a lot. It's uh, uh, a lot of curiosity, I think, a lot of uh, interest, some confusion about uh, how things are going, so I really appreciate the opportunity to try to, to clarify a little bit. Um, I'll say a couple things right up front. Uh, I'm not an advocate for one system or another, uh, either the status quo or uh, for uh, some of the proposed changes. Um, I, I mean, I will vote, uh, but I, I don't have strong feelings one way or the other. In fact, I'm kind of indifferent uh, in, in ways that it's not necessarily true of a lot of people who uh, will talk to you about this. So I, I just, uh, I, I, I'm an equal opportunity offender in that case. Um, I, if, you're, if, you're, if you like one of them, you're going to find something I say uh, probably offensive because I am critical of all the systems, uh, largely because I don't think there's any one perfect system. Uh, and. Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about anybody who, who would claim otherwise. Um, let me start, though, by and, and invite you to ask questions along the way, because I, I understand that these aren't necessarily the clearest things, and hopefully I'm, I'm giving you some clarity uh, as we go through. Just let me say a little bit about how we've got to this point uh, in British Columbia right now. Uh, this isn't the first time. Uh, I will see nodding heads if I say this, that we tried uh, uh, changing our electoral system in BC. Uh, people remember uh, in this audience, uh, we all had, you all had the chance to vote, I'm sure, uh, in 2005 and in 2009 when we considered uh, electoral reform the last time. Uh, and that process in 2005, uh, really that was the key uh, part of it, uh, was uh, initiated by the BC Liberals uh, with uh, some, uh, uh, you know, design, I guess, uh, credit to Gordon Gibson, the former leader of that party, uh, who had proposed that the way to change our electoral system in British Columbia would be uh, to, to be very citizen-driven. So he devised something called the Citizens' Assembly. Uh, and that was a randomized sample of two people from every one of the 79 at that time constituencies in the province uh, who were chosen at public meetings a little bit like this. People would come, and if they were let their names stand. Uh, they could be drawn, one man, one woman, from each of the 79 constituencies across the country, uh, province. Uh, a a after they were chosen, they gathered here in the Lower Mainland uh, on a few occasions uh, in a sort of learning phase where they learned about all the different electoral systems in the world, a deliberation phase where they thought about, well, what would we want to be in the sort of ideal uh, electoral system from their perspective, and a decision phase where they actually came up with a proposal uh, that was then put to referendum in 2005. So they came up with a proposal called the BC STV, or Single Transferable Vote, which was a, you know, a design, fully designed uh, system for the province of British Columbia uh, going forward. Uh, that was then voted on uh, by regular voters in the 2005, or in, you know, alongside the 2005 election. Uh, it was a ballot, essentially, that, that went at the same time as that, uh, as that provincial election. Uh, the threshold there was 60%. So 60% of British Columbians had to agree uh, on, the, on, on the proposal. Uh, and in addition to that, it's it sort of double majority, as we would call it. You had to get a majority. All 79 constituencies in the province had to agree with it as well, uh, given that we have sort of quite varying uh, nature of the constituencies in the province that, you know, that sort of affect uh, you know, rural ridings maybe a little bit differently than others. Uh, the outcome in 2005 was 57% in favor, um, so it didn't meet the 60% threshold, and 77 constituencies did have a majority. Uh, but that, you know, extraordinary high threshold uh, meant that it didn't pass at uh, that time. So we had a second opportunity in 2009 uh, with the same option on the ballot, uh, and that actually didn't do nearly as well. Uh, the, there was a more uh, organized no uh, campaign against it, and a lot of the enthusiasm that maybe had been there in 2005 had sort of dissipated by then, uh, and, and so we sort of forgot about it. Uh, 2018, uh, the 2017 uh, election, we had uh, a very tight result, as you recall, um, a short-lived uh, liberal government following the election, and then a, uh, a, a essentially a coalition of, of now the NDP and Greens, uh, and part of the negotiations between them uh, was to consider electoral reform uh, because one of the primary beneficiaries of a more proportional electoral system in our province, at least based on present uh, uh, vote share, would be the Green Party, right? They got 17, almost 17 percent of the popular vote in the last election and got three uh, of the seats in the 87-person assembly uh, in Victoria. Uh, 
you don't need a math degree to figure out that three is not 17% of 87, right? So the, the present system discriminates uh, pretty strongly against the Green Party, so they've been advocates of this uh, of a more proportional system uh, for some time. Um, so uh, the present government, the NDP government, uh, did engage in a consultative phase. Uh, this was basically an open consultation. People were invited to submit uh, uh, comments on the internet uh, or fill out questionnaires on the internet on this how we vote consultation. Uh, there's about seven volumes of 200 plus comments uh, on uh, from the public, and then there was a more sort of elite-based uh, uh, kind of consultation as well, where they engaged some groups that had opinions about electoral uh, reform. Uh, the 200 is generous. Uh, there were there were comments like I looked through them all. <laughs> There's like a one-line email. This is dumb. You know that was that was that counted as a comment uh, or, or consultation. Uh, then there was a 40-page uh, proposal by somebody who was a electoral systems hobbyist who decided to you know, invent something and, and proposed it to them. So it was quite varying uh, quality of, of consultation. Uh, ultimately, the Attorney General's office, David Eby's office, uh, staff there wrote a report, uh, the How We Vote report, uh, which, uh, which proposed three models uh, and you know, the models that we see now on the referendum uh, ballot that you have probably sitting on your kitchen table because uh, I assume everyone who's here wants to know what to do and hasn't already made up their mind and sent it in. Um, uh, the referendum questions were approved by Elections BC as being, you know, fair questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, by the, the standard of referendum questions uh, globally and, and even in Canada, it is a fairly clear, straightforward one. Uh, the, the options themselves might not be especially clear to people, but the, the question itself is relatively straightforward. Uh, if those of you who recall, uh, the, the two uh, referendums on sovereignty in Quebec uh, might you know, think back and, or even go back and look at the questions that were asked in those two <coughs> referendums. Uh, the, the outcome would have been fairly clear, uh, but the question itself was uh, a tangled knot uh, that, that made it a little bit hard to understand exactly what people were voting for uh, at the time and it's sort of seen as intentionally complicated uh, in some ways or vague. The threshold this time is 50% plus one, and the process uh, is the mail-in ballot, which is familiar now to British Columbians who uh, participated in a similar uh, form uh, for HST referendum a couple of years ago, right? So uh, we've, we've had this mail-in form uh, before, but it's not you know, contiguous with uh, a provincial election because the goal is that if we're going to make this change, that it would be able to be something that could be in place for the 2021 uh, election here in British Columbia. <coughs> All right, so that, that is uh, uh, quite a significant difference in process. I have some opinions about that, but we'll save uh, some of that discussion uh, for a, a little bit later. Uh, let me try to uh, just give you a real clear sense of what uh, you're being asked to do uh, in, as voters in this, uh, in this referendum. So there's a, a two-part question, essentially, uh, on your ballot. Uh, the first question uh, is, should we reform the system? Uh, yes uh, to some form of proportional representation or no uh, to keep the status quo. I've used uh, my preferred uh, term for it, single member plurality, SMP, uh, but we've, we've probably, you've probably been hearing first past the post, FPTP. Um, I don't know, I have a six-year-old son and TP sounds too much like toilet paper uh, and he would laugh at that and I don't think, so I just don't say it because if I even say the letter P, he laughs. Uh, so, uh, so SMP, he'd probably laugh at that too. Uh, but single member plurality is essentially what we're talking about. A, a single member for a given electoral district elected on the basis of having the plurality of votes uh, at, at, at election time. So whether it's a majority or, or less, just more than anybody else, right? That they're, that they're, they're the first past the post, as, as the saying uh, goes. So if you vote no uh, on that first question, that's, that's signaling uh, a preference for the status quo. If you vote yes, you're saying you would like to endorse some form of proportional representation. And this is as good a time as any to note that proportional representation is not a form of electoral, uh, electoral system. It's a family of electoral systems. Right, that uh, all proportional representation systems are systems that try to make the results in a legislature more proportional to the overall uh, popular vote. Right? So all PR systems, all proportional representation systems, are trying to find uh, 
a, a device or a mechanism to take you know the the public's <coughs> preferences as expressed especially through their support for political parties and replicate that in the legislature uh, that's not really what first past the post does particularly well right at first past the post gives you a good idea of who is the most popular in any one of the ridings uh, in the province, but it tends to, to pervert the overall provincial results. Uh, the Green Party is a good example. It's popular uh, in, in Oak Bay. It, it means it elects its, its leader there. Uh, but, you know, that 17% in the rest of the province doesn't get them very far, right? So, uh, likewise, uh, if you can get 55%, or if you recall, uh, Gordon Campbell in 2001 uh, uh, had something like 67% of the popular vote, you can get almost all the seats in the legislature, right? Because uh, it, mag it tends to magnify uh, that result. So if, if you recall that first Gordon Campbell government, it had the ferocious opposition of two people, uh, one of whom is very short, Joy McPhail, um, and, and they surrounded her apparently with the biggest, meatiest men uh, in, on, in the BC Liberal Caucus to, to make her feel even smaller. Uh, not, not, they played hardball back in those days, uh, but, uh, but apparently, uh, you know, that, that's the kind of result we can get. But that might have been the motivation for the 2005 uh, choice. All right, so uh, let's talk a bit about uh, the, these options for PR uh, that we have. Uh, on the second question on the ballot, you're asked to rank uh, one through three, uh, or one and two, or just one if you want, so you, you have a lot of freedom in this part of the ballot. Uh, three proposed uh, methods of, uh, of, of achieving a more proportional system uh, in, in British Columbia. Um, I don't think these are in the order that they put them on the ballot, and I, but these are the order I'm going to present them to you. And so, uh, the dual member system, the multi-member system, or the rural urban uh, proportional system. Uh, and I want to take some time just to go through each of those three because I'm sure uh, people would like a little bit more explanation about that. And if you look at the back side of your handout, that's what the proposed uh, ballots would look like. So, so it's kind of what you're looking at, <laughs> the side of the ballots, uh, the sample. And I'll put those up here as well, but I thought it might be handy for people to have uh, them in their hand. Yes? Do you know why uh, STV was not included as an option? Well, there is an STV option in here, but they didn't want to go with the former, the BC STV uh, option. Okay. But one of these three methods does include an STV element. So it is, it is one of the ones, uh, it it's informs the options. <laughs> like I'm a teacher, I have to talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> hey, I, I just want to sort of uh, tell you a little bit about what I could say is true of all three of the options that are available to you. So if you are a, uh, a PR person, you like this idea of a more proportional system, that you really can't go wrong with the, the, the options. All three are going to be more proportional uh, than, than the present first past the post system. I mean, that's, that, that should be a given, but they all uh, are going to be more proportional. Uh, and all do try, all three proposed methods, do try to give us some compensation uh, for uh, I don't want to say absolutely unique, but the, the relatively unique nature of uh, the province of British Columbia. Uh, you know, a big portion, obviously, of the people who live here live in this tiny little corner down in the bottom uh, southwest and on the island. Uh, and then we have all this space that's like, you know, bigger than many European countries and so on uh, that has a lot fewer people. Um, but, you know, all systems, electoral systems, try to you know, we're electing a representative legislature here, right? So we want representatives for all those places. Uh, but it is quite challenging to represent, you know, the the the, uh, the, the northernmost quarter of the province, right? It's not easy uh, to get around between the communities that are up there. Uh, they're they're quite uh, you know sparsely populated, uh, but they are part of uh, of the province, right? And so. Uh, all the systems that are being proposed try to compensate a little bit for that to make it not so hard to represent people uh, in the less dense parts of the province uh, and to make sure that they get some uh, kind of regional representation because their 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 goals uh, their needs can be quite often quite different than you know the ones of the lower mainland uh, you know the you know transportation is a different 
question in the north than it is uh, in, in, in down here and, and all the kinds of other things you can think of. Uh, but you know, things that cost money either way, uh, we, want, we don't want to just sort of exclude uh, those people from the system. So all three systems do try to provide, uh, try to compensate for that a little bit. All do seek what we would call proportionality, try to get the system more proportional. And all three um, do focus on this phenomenon that is often criticized of first past the post, of the so-called wasted vote. Now, sometimes when I say this to people, they get all mad, there's no such thing as a wasted vote, and then others don't, so we'll see, we'll judge the room as we talk about this. But the, the, the argument goes, of critics of first past the post, is that any vote that isn't for the winner is essentially wasted, right? So if you voted green here in West Vancouver, uh, Ralph Sultan is popular enough in West Vancouver uh, that your green vote didn't make much of a difference to uh, you know, the outcome in, the, in this riot. Uh, it added to that 17% that the party got across the province, uh, but that's just a sort of kick in the gut to the Greens who only get you know three of the seats in the legislature, but know that they have more uh, popularity out there. So people uh, categorize that as wasted votes. Uh, in, in some of the sort of more dynastic provinces in Canada, this is even more of a problem. I grew up in, in, um, in Alberta in the 70s and 80s. Uh, when the, the Conservative Party, the Progressive Conservative Party, was was very dominant uh, in that province, and, and essentially, if you didn't vote for the PCs through decades in that period, you were wasting your vote, according to the critics of first past the post, because very few times were uh, anyone elected other than late 80s into the 90s, the Liberals and others started to do some things, but it, certainly through the Peter Lockheed years, it was you know it was Conservatives uh, essentially only. Um, all the systems proposed try to keep local representation, but uh, there's no question that all of the models would have bigger ridings, bigger constituencies uh, than we have now. So right now the province is divided into these 87 pieces. Uh, all the proposed models would probably add a few seats here and there, um, but all of the constituencies themselves would be larger uh, because all the different you know, all the different mechanisms uh, for proportionality uh, would need the, the space that people are representing to be larger. Uh, the only exception would be uh, the, the writings that are already quite large. So the, 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 the sparsely populated writings in, in British Columbia's North would probably stay pretty much the same uh, because they're about as big as you can make it and still have one person uh, represent them, right? So they're just they're just so uh, spread out uh, and so difficult to, to actually represent otherwise that we wouldn't dream of kind of putting them together. And that speaks to that first point. All three systems uh, proposed would give parties or what we could call professional politicians a bit more of a role uh, in making decisions about who ultimately uh, will be in the legislature. Uh, so right now, most of that is controlled uh, by local constituency associations, right? They're the ones that choose uh, their nominee uh, and uh, are the ones who are going to get, uh, you know, either stand for election. Uh, but all three of the proposed systems would have some role uh, for people other than those constituency associations to make choices about who some of the representatives might be. Uh, that's probably going to mean a central party, uh, you know, so the, 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 the leader and staff around the leader are going to have a bit more of a role in uh, making those decisions. Now, that's not to say in the present system we don't have a little bit of that going on already. Uh, there are, you know, parachuted in star candidates uh, and all kinds of ridings uh, across the province. Uh, but this would be very likely uh, in any of the three systems uh, that we're, we're looking at. Okay, so those are the those are things that are similar about them. Let me try to explain uh, the differences between them. So the dual member system um, is a, a proposal uh, that came from a, a, a Canadian, a, a, a guy who was a, a math student at the University of Alberta, essentially invented this, uh, proposed it uh, to, the, to the people in the Attorney General's office, it's been out there uh, as a model, uh, and they saw some value in it and decided that this was good enough uh, to be uh, one of the options uh, on the system. Um, what would happen under the present system, the, the change that we would have uh, from if we chose dual member, is that most existing districts in the province uh, would pair up. So probably the ones next to each other, uh, there would be a, a boundaries commission that would have to make this decision just as it draws the lines already uh, between the, the ridings. Um, so I've talked about this on the North Shore before. I think when I talked in the district of North Van, 
we figured that the city of North Van and, and the district one would be put together. Uh, with West Van, it's probably West Van and then whatever is next uh, along the Sea to Sky corridor, those would be the sort of natural ones uh, to go together. Uh, but you know, you can, you can kind of try to figure it out just by looking at a map for most parts of the province, the two that would make sense to, to put together. Um, and, and so if you look at this picture, which is included in the Elections BC material that you got about a week before uh, your ballot arrived, uh, this is how they kind of see it in these denser urban areas. Uh, you know, these two would come together and you'd have two representatives. Uh, in these more suburban, uh, you know, less dense but not, you know, fully rural ridings, uh, they would be bigger. And then we, again, as I said, we keep those really big ones, uh, like in the far north of the province, uh, essentially as is. Um, so in the dual member system, uh, the ballot then, uh, I think I've titled it as the dual member one, is that the one in the middle? Um, or no, it's the one on the, on the right. Uh, asks you to choose uh, one party, uh, and the parties themselves list two uh, candidates. Uh, and the parties would make the decision about the primary candidate and the secondary candidate. They list these two uh, like that. There's also an opportunity in that ballot, as you see at the bottom, uh, for independent candidates. Right, so an independent could still run in this system. Uh, and th essentially, the ballots are counted uh, the same way we count first past the post right now. The person with the most votes uh, in uh, that ballot, uh, or the party with the most votes in that ballot, would get the first seat in the dual member seat. Uh, so it's assigned uh, on, on, you know, on a plurality basis. If you get a big majority, that's great, but you just have to have more than any of the other parties uh, on, on that list. Uh, if a party wins uh, the, the ballot in, in that riding, then they get that first seat of the two uh, dual members that would be representing uh, that riding. So you can see the ballot there in front of you, uh, but it lists here party A, party B, party C, and D. Uh, party C only ran one candidate, uh, the other three uh, ran uh, two. This is just wholly hypothetical, as you might guess. Uh, and then you had an independent candidate. Uh, but party A wins if we assume that, you know, got lots of votes because they X'd it and they sent it to everybody in the province. Um, so there you go, uh, party A won, uh, they would get that first seat. So the most votes in the riding wins the first seat. And then the second seat is the really complicated part uh, of this system. The second seat is distributed uh, to make the overall provincial results more proportional. And so, essentially, uh, what we do is we're running a first-past-the-post election with half as many seats, if you want to think of it that way. So the first half would be elected on the basis of who wins, because we have half as many districts now, or a little bit less, a little bit more than half as many districts now. Uh, and then uh, we have to redistribute uh, preferences, essentially, for uh, the remainder to get them to that popular vote share that the party's got, right? Because if you look at that ballot, uh, you're, you're really voting for a party. You know, if, if your preference is the secondary candidate for your party, it's not a guarantee that they're gonna get that spot. Uh, the, the most likely person to win any riding uh, is gonna be the primary candidate for the listed uh, parties. Uh, and, and even then, of course, they're, they're not necessarily uh, the one who's gonna get it if, if their party doesn't do well. So it really brings parties into this maybe even more than we do now, right? I mean, parties matter to the way we think about voting now, but essentially they're asking you to vote for a party, uh, and the candidate element is, is kind of secondary to it. Okay, so, yeah. no, I'm just going to go through that. Right. So you, in effect, you're not voting for person A. Right. So, you, you re, so you're really not having that option. You're voting for a party, yeah. but you're not yeah. voting for a party. Um, I mean, the, the reality is for parties as they see it, uh, you know, strategically, I would think, is that they want to make sure they have a primary candidate in a riding that they think can win, right? And so, you know, a lot of the incumbents that are right now, they would likely be uh, primary candidates uh, in the next election, right? Because they, they've already won and showed that they could win in at least half of the riding uh, that now is going to exist. So uh, I, I hesitate to... to guess about Mr. Sultan, he's getting into his 80s, I think, now, but, you know, it's only a couple years away, maybe he still wants to run again. Uh, you know, if he did, uh, you would 
see him and and uh, and and, uh, and his colleague up to the, the see the sky, uh, you know, probably be primary and secondary listed uh, on that that ballot, uh, and that would mean, you know, if 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 the liberals have strong support in this riding, like I imagine they do, uh, then he'll he'll get elected. The question about whether the secondary candidate would get elected is harder, uh, and so you're not going to necessarily, you know, if your if your preference is for the secondary candidate. All you can really express is a preference for uh, the party they've chosen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the person in, no, your, no. in your district or whatever your constituency who gets the second most right. votes in theory could be bumped by someone due to proportional representation or percentages based throughout the province. Yeah, and they'll be one of the people on this list. Okay. Right. So, so someone parachuted. No, it won't be parachuted in. The person who comes in will be. But it could be. I, I hesitate to try to explain this part of it because it is just. Sort of a math problem, but it could be the person who got the fourth most vote, for example, in that area. But because uh, no, it's likely to be the party that came in second in the area if the party, on its proportionality, is entitled to another seat. Uh, because uh, the the person who the, the way they'll distribute them is they'll they'll give the first ones to the places where the party did best. <laughs> So let's say Sultan or the Liberals get 50% of the popular vote in this riding. Uh, the B party gets 40% of the popular vote in this riding. Uh, you know, based on what I told you, this is the person who's going to get the first seat. Uh, but when they go to do the math for the province, coming in with 40% is really strong. So you're likely to get that, that primary candidate from that party. If somebody got 80% of the popular vote, if a party gets 80, they're likely to elect both of these people, right? Because that's that, that's going to really strengthen their hand when the counting comes along. So uh, I think Abbotsford probably does this. <laughs> the, like the, the BC Liberal support is really strong uh, out in the valley. Uh, they sometimes have 78% of the popular vote in, in some of those writings. So that would be one of those cases. It would be rare that both representatives for any riding would be from the same party, but it could happen. Uh, and it's most likely to be the, the most popular and the second most popular party uh, in the riding would be the ones that would be represented. Let's see a couple more questions. What about if there is more than one independent candidate? Well, if, if there, independent candidates don't get any proportionality, but if independent candidates win the first past the post element of this ballot, they're automatically elected. So, so that's actually where we would have an indeterminate number of seats in the legislature. Uh, it would be at least 87, uh, but it might be more, might be less, depending on how many independents uh, run. Uh, one, you know, as a prognosticator, one thing I see is parties sort of manipulating this a little bit, that, oh, well, this is an independent, <laughs> but he'll vote with us and it'll be okay, uh, because it might help them get two ridings, two seats out of a dual member riding. Uh, but that's something to sort of sort out a down the line in the sense of will, it, will parties conform to that kind of behavior or will they they see that as a little bit of a risky strategy yeah this may be going this is going back a step but i feel i need to ask yep. it at this point before going to sure. further the writings mm -hmm. that are going to be decided by the independent commission mm -hmm. at some point after right. the vote uh it concerns me that for such an important decision on behalf of people in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Why have the ridings not already been determined? That's so I mean, that goes know. back to my process question as well, is that we're not seeing nearly the same uh, level of detail about what the proposals are. Um, I, I would be confident in the process being independent for drawing the boundaries, uh, because you know, um, in Canada in general, uh, we have a superior process for boundary drawing to, you know, pretty much anywhere else in North America. Uh, certainly, would say uh, in comparison to the United States. Uh, uh, you know, I've had lots of colleagues who've served on independent boundary commissions, uh, and they. Uh, one of my favorite remarks is one of my colleagues who did it in New Brunswick. He said, "I'm a tenured full professor. Uh, the other two guys on the commission were uh, federal judges." He said, "If there's anybody I can think of in the country who gives less of a crap what." Some politician tries to tell me to do. Uh, I can't think of anyone because you know they're 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 essentially insulated from any kind of political pressure that way. Uh, uh, and so that process is pretty bulletproof, uh, but it doesn't make it clear to people exactly what their representation is going to look like in the future. And I find that. 
problematic. I do, I agree that they didn't go any farther to say even hypothetically, um, you know, the government hasn't said that Sea to Sky and West Van would go together. I'm pre pre presuming that, and I think it's a pretty strong presumption, but, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that is left unsaid for sure. So I agree with you that it's, it's problematic. I think there was one last comment yeah. back or question. Uh, I think it's been answered. Okay, great. So, um, so the second seed is distributed to essentially make it more proportional. It is a, a complicated process. Uh, it's the most math-centered of it all, hence the math student uh, coming up with it. Uh, but it, but it, it would be proportional. One of my uh, former graduate students has done some blogging about uh, electoral reform this time around. Uh, and in his simulations, which he ran with some computer simulations, he thinks this would be the most proportional system of the ones that are proposed. This would get us closest to, you know, like 13% of the popular vote, 13% of the seats, that sort of thing. You know, obviously, with 87 seats or 87 to 95 seats, uh, you can't have a perfect correlation. You know, you're going to be a, a percentage point or so off in some cases. But all of these systems, as I said, are going to be much more closer to proportional uh, than, than the present system is. Has this been used anywhere in the world? No, so this is a, a Canadian invention that is yet to be tested. Uh, that's right. uh, again, one of the criticisms of this process, right, that we've, we've kind of embarked on three options, two of which are uh, untested, uh, although they, they, they're basically forms of, of systems that are out there, but, but different, uh, for sure. Yeah, sir. Because of the amount of people that are in Vancouver, or greater Vancouver, would they just be one one constituent or would they link up with something else? Um, so, uh, I mean, if you think about, like, for example, Carisdale, where the leader of the, the BC Liberals is now, Colchana, I guess it's called, uh, that would probably fit together with uh, Chrissy Clark's old writing, David Eby's writing, you know, oh, point right. Like, you know, they, they would, it, would, it would almost in all cases pair up. Uh, most of the writings in the province are relatively similar in, in population size. Um, you know, plus or minus about 10%, uh, plus or minus maybe 20% in a couple of the nor northern ridings. They're, 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 under, they're over represented because they're hard to represent. Uh, but, you know, Vancouver, uh, you know, the West End one would match up with the most adjacent one, that sort of thing. That, because the numbers already, I mean, like the, the most densely populated ones are the smallest ones, right? right. So, so the West End is, is actually a, a riding. You know, it's, you can walk around it in like 10 minutes uh, or an hour. Uh, you know, whereas up north, you have to get a plane, <laughs> right? So, so we already are kind of compensating because it's right now we represent population, right? So you represent uh, those, those sizes. So the mixed member system is the one that we have <laughs> that have some uh, experience elsewhere to, to draw on. Uh, it's used in, in a number of European countries. Um, so uh, the way this would work is essentially uh, we'd have two categories of MLAs rather than. Um, then two representatives from each riding. Uh, what we're going to have is 60% of the seats, uh, so about 60% of the present 87 would be drawn as single member ridings like we have now. So bigger ridings, right, because there, there's less of them, uh, but they would be uh, essentially the same, and they'd be won on the same basis by a plurality of votes. Uh, so you would vote uh, in, in that riding, that's the one in the middle, right? Uh, you would have uh, a vote for your riding uh, that's going to choose one representative, and you also have a party vote, uh, which is separate from that. Uh, and uh, what would happen is we would have all these ridings. You see, they're a bit bigger. The northern ones are pretty much the same with a single representative in them. But this green circle is we would break the province into five or six regions, uh, and those regions would be adjusted uh, to, uh, to make them more proportional. So if, if there's regional support for different parties, that's where they're going to get uh, some of the top up that they would need uh, to make them more proportional uh, in their result. So your ballot has two choices, one for a candidate, one for a party. On the basis of the candidate, we just choose that plurality. And then on that party basis, there's some distribution of seats uh, to, to get to proportionality. So uh, you, can, you can make two different choices. Uh, and here you can be kind of complex in your preferences, right? You like, uh, you know, you like Jim because his kids played little league with yours, and he seems like a good guy. Uh, you're going to vote for him, but your heart is really with this party. Uh, you can you can express that complicated set of preferences this time, right? Or you can say, I want to split it because I don't like anybody to have too much power, right? You could even uh, go uh, in that that kind of thinking uh, if you want to, but you can have a complex preference in ways that 
our present system certainly doesn't give you uh, that option, right? I mean, a lot of people uh, have complex preference, but they have to make a simple choice uh, in, in our ballot. Um, so the remaining 40% of the seats would be filled by those regional lists, uh, and that would match the province-wide popular vote on that second uh, part of the ballot. Um, the list, uh, and this is true of list-style PR systems, is likely to be made by the party, uh, and you just have a, a kind of prioritized list from 1 to 40 or something, uh, and uh, as parties' entitlements for extra seats go down the list, uh, they just check off the names of those people uh, who are going to be outside the, the green ring there. These are extras. Uh, they're they're going to be representatives for the whole region, but they're not going to have this kind of community-based, uh, constituency-based representational role. They're more party uh, representatives than they are, you know, constituency-based uh, representatives. When you have a, a mixed member ballot, you mm -hmm. get a representative for West Van? Yeah, so like I said, the riding would be bigger. Uh, the riding would be bigger, but it would be a representative who would then hold a, have a constituency office and all that sort of stuff. But right? on that list, would it be candidate? I'm sorry. Would be candidate would be my Yeah, it's your, it's your district vote. Right? So that would be the first one. Yeah, yeah. this is the person who's going to say they're the you know, MLA for <laughs> West Vancouver, Sea to Sky Country or something. And then when they do the Actually, I would, I would think that. Uh, just kind of very loosely doing the math, that it would probably look more like our federal constituencies for the province, right? Because that's about the, the, the ratio, actually, uh, of population size right now. So, uh, you know, West Van Sea to Sky is a federal district, right? And and the, the provincial ones are half that size, so it would be something closer to, to that uh, in terms. But you would have a representative who would have all that kind of traditional constituency uh, responsibilities that would go along with that. Uh, where the regions are and so on is a little un you know, undetermined, same as uh, the, the dual member map. And who, I, would the, who would this second member be? Would his name be? Oh, so it's not a, it's not a dual member be? system, right? It's the, the, the others are going to be these regional uh, MLAs. Uh, so they would call them, I don't know what they're going to call the regions, but they probably say, um, you know, Lower Mainland, Fraser Valley, or they probably say, I don't know. <laughs> my geography, uh, you know, Fraser Valley would probably be a region, uh, the island would be a region, and they would have these extra compensatory uh, members uh, in them. Uh, and so they would be kind of free-floating, right? They wouldn't necessarily have to uh, think of representing one small community, but overall this kind of regional uh, block for the province. Would they be independent, or would they be associated with a party? Oh, they'll all be party MLAs, yeah, because so they're elected on the basis of what the party needs, right? So there's no room for independent? Um, Independents could uh, be in this mixed member system because they can uh, they can be uh, uh, wouldn't have to have a party label here, right? Because uh, you could just have candidate Z independent uh, because you're voting for, but they'd have to win out of this system, right? Uh, and the reality of independence, as you probably all know, is very poor opportunities for independence in our system now. Uh, that's not going to change. In fact, parties are given more priority in most of these PR systems. See, lots of questions. Yeah. You'd end up with a the district could be an NDP person and the local person would be maybe a liberal. It strikes me there's some unintended consequences, but how do those two guys work together? Well, I mean, solve my yeah. problem with it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think in a mixed member system, you're essentially looking to your your district member, the, the person who's representing the riding that you live in, as your kind of constituency MP or MLA. Uh, and the others are, are more about the functioning of the legislature than they are about uh, about kind of being your person. In the dual member system, you would have the same thing. You'd have members of two parties. Uh, some people think that that would make them more competitive to be the best constituency uh, representatives, uh, you know, help their constituents the most with problems with, uh, you know, the provincial government. Uh, you know, that's a possibility for sure that that, that could happen. Uh, but, they, but they certainly wouldn't necessarily coordinate unless they were you know, unless they're very cooperative people. Well, that, yeah, that's yeah. my whole point. It would be sort of like the, the Senate and the, and the Congress in, in the right. U.S. Yeah. There's gridlock as soon as you've got... It might be a little bit, yeah. But I, mean, but I mean, the, the way that parties will be in the legislature will be much more about the way they behave in the legislature, which is already about, you know, which party you belong to, right? So, uh, sort of the two different roles we're looking for from our MLAs is the, you know, serving their constituency and then being part of the lawmaking process in Victoria, 
uh, and you know the, the, it's going to be parties. It's already parties that dominate there, and they're going to continue to dominate uh, in, in Victoria for sure. Question back there. Yeah, uh, the region, so the regional MLA comes from these lists that are created by the party. Um, so, uh, the, I mean, the parties could could pass this process over to something local to say, give us the six people for the list because there's six possible uh, uh, seats here. Uh, but uh, parties don't tend to want to give away that much uh, power either. They And there might be people, activists, people within the party that they want to give some of that opportunity to, right? So you, you could see people who... Uh, they they might have a hard time getting elected as a constituency MLA, but they could get in as a, a regional list MLA because you know uh, they're a bit crusty. They're not very good with retail politics, but they want them in the legislature, right? Right. So these would be the, the true professional politicians that people might not think. Uh, and, and this is a this is an unsavory potentially part of, of this proposed model, right? That there is. The, the people tend not to like this part. The BC Citizens Assembly hated this kind of option, right? So they purposely chose something that wouldn't give this kind of role uh, to political parties. So you're basically voting for a person for your district and then an idea for your region. Yeah, a party. Yeah, uh, I mean, so uh, you know, you, you're expressing that party preference, and that's just going to get them closer to their proportional share. Uh, the only proportionality we're matching is the, the that vote in that first column on the, the, the ballot that I showed you, right? So so what happens in that first in that district vote isn't counted in this, right? So it's, it doesn't matter what share of the vote they get in that, what parties get in that side. I think there was... Uh, yeah, so, so just, if I hear what you're saying correctly, these individuals who are on the party list mm -hmm. <clears throat> may not necessarily have been on any... They did not run as a candidate, right? Mm -hmm. So they're chosen separately yeah. by the party. Yeah. But I mean, we picked the parties, right? We, yeah. 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 So, so that the party decides who's going to represent. Yeah. So we said that we, okay. you know, our, if if the public's expression of support for Party X is that they should get ten percent of the seats in the legislature, uh, Party X will deliver candidates who can take up some of those spaces. But those candidates, those people's names will not be known before the election? Um, they might be known. They, they, might, they might make that list uh, available. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it's likely. I mean, it's, it's a practice in probably most PR systems that, that those are available. I mean, the, okay. their, the name recognition of those, a lot of those people won't be super high. Anyway, if I told you that Mike McDonald would be on the BC Liberal Party list, would you know who? He's Christy Clark's best friend. They've been, you know, He's a former chief of staff. Well, insiders would know some of those names, but you know uh, it would be unlikely. But, um, Thank you. And who would they represent? Would they represent my riding? Or would no, they they're they're the part of the region, and then the party. Right? Oh, the region. Yeah, they're part of that bigger region, that green circle area. One question: there. Can somebody be both on the district, the district candidate, and on the party list? They get two chances to get in. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's not super clear. I mean, I would think that that would be one of the things that they have to decide, uh, and that they probably would decide against, uh, but might not decide against, right? So that, that you could give somebody two chances uh, in that regard. But so it's the party might want to put the leader of the party in that situation. Right. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about leaders who tend to sometimes lose their their constituency. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, that, would, that would be the easiest way to make sure the leader. Uh, and in fact, uh, I mean, I don't know if anyone's had an experience of having a leader of the political party as their MLA. Uh, it might be a better way to actually have leaders in the assembly because they're not often the strongest constituency uh, MLAs, right? Because they're often bouncing all around uh, the province, and unless unless their constituency is in Victoria, uh, you know, they're likely to not spend a lot of time there and so on. I mean, they can be popular in their writings, but not necessarily very present in their writings, right? Because uh, of, their, of the, their responsibilities. Uh, even more true of the Prime Minister, right? Yeah. Um, if I vote for a certain candidate mm -hmm. that's part of the party, um, that candidate will still get in even though another party wins? No, nope. uh, I mean, you have to, you have to, they have to win that, that vote, right? So if you pick candidate Y, he's, uh, she's got to win the riding, right? She's got to get that plurality. Uh, in, in the writing. So, uh, and, and this actually, this vote, at least as they framed it here, the, the ballot might be a little bit different than this. Um, 
but it, in this form, expressing a support for party C isn't counted in this part of it, right? It's where you express it here. So, I mean, people, uh, I, we would guess that a majority of people would say, I like candidate Y for party C, and I like party C, uh, but you could be more complicated. If you if you if you if you're like a really subtle person, you want to split it up. Uh, you can. Candidate is part of a certain party. Yeah. Candidate Y is part of party Y. C. Yeah. C. But party C doesn't win. Does that can does that candidate still become? Oh, so if you're saying you voted for this person, um, and so yeah, I like the the dual member system. Uh, if, if you know if you're the runner up in in a in the district vote. You're unlikely to get in the legislature, right? Uh, if you're the runner-up in the dual member vote, you have a good chance still if your party is doing well and you're one of the compensatory seats. Uh, but if you come in second here, you're not going to be part of the the, the the list seats necessarily, unless uh, the question is, you know, will, would you have a spot on the list as a sort of second chance? Uh, so my problem is, what if they do come in first? Mm -hmm. Why wins? Yep. But their party doesn't. No, but if candidate Y wins in this, this this is this seat is candidate Y's. Okay. If you win in that district, they're they're in. Even though your party doesn't win. Well, it, I mean, it, it's still a district by district, you know, contest, right? So, okay. so you just, I mean, it doesn't mean you won the election. Uh, it means that you won the seat. Yeah. But you need a you need a majority of the seats to win the election, right? So that's that's the, the question. I think that. No, I'm still not clear how, <laughs> how you can vote for a candidate from one party, and then you want to vote for another party, and that other party gets in, does your candidate still win? If yeah, because the these two doesn't... things are counted separately. They're counted separately. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is counted, uh, whoever gets the plurality here wins the writing, uh, and then these are, are, are imported into the overall provincial or regional uh, popular vote. Uh, and the, a decision is made about how many seats each party should get. So that means my candidate in the end, my right. candidate here, right. may not indeed be part of the ruling party for the end of the election. Yeah, well, I mean, it, at the end of the election, we just know who has seats based on the two contests, right? Um, yeah. So party B wins that thing. The district, yeah. Yeah. So with the candidate X, who is party B, right. are they the person that goes in for party B? Yep. Oh, well, so I mean, they're, they're going as a representative of party B. Uh, the, 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 the list seats are going to be off that, that separate list. Right? So there's this extra list uh, that are, and, and it, you know, if you look at, if you look at this, Remember, it's a, the, the, the ratio is about six to four, right? So six constituency MLAs, yeah. four list MLAs, you know, because it's a 60-40 split uh, across the province. So, you know, if, if we're talking about, if we're talking about um, roughly 100 seats, there's going to be 10 of these six and four regions, right? Uh, if we're going to have less or we're going to have bigger regions, maybe it would be a little bit different. But these are the people who won that district vote. And then, you know, it looks relatively now, similar. Now, when you say these are the people, that is the going down that side, the uh, right side. candidate on the right side. Yeah. Right side. Yeah. So these are the can these are the right side people. These are the left side people of your ballot. Oh, okay. In that in that system. Right. Yeah. <laughs> For me? Yeah, in mixed number, yeah. <laughs> MLA. These are the district MLAs. These are, are the they're, districts. So they're the ones. Oh, okay. Yeah. You district choose those. District vote. Yeah. Okay. And party vote is equal to regional MLA. Right. So the party vote helps to decide who those are going to be. Okay. So yeah. party vote is the region. Yes. Yeah. Yep. 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 On the left hand side. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about the party vote. Mm -hmm. Is it like a game of poker where you don't see the cards until the game is over? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, the list. yeah, that was the question. I mean, it's, not, it's, not, it's not set. In the, in the, it could be that. It could be that, or it could be the, but, it, but like as I said before, it might also be we could have a list and we wouldn't recognize a lot of Here's people. Here's my hand, yeah. and then we have the election, and then we say, I lied. Here's my hand, yeah. actually. No. Um, it, it is possible to do that. Yeah. 
I mean, that, that's probably why I would think that the choice would be to have uh, an open list, like a, a clear so have, list. You know, so it's up to yeah. so uh, we get. Uh, but I, I don't think it, I don't think I don't think the parties would draw lists in ways that would be especially informative to people, other than <laughs> that they would be other than they would be a promise, right? I mean, there would be people who you could say, "Oh, look at number one, you know, the the the, the person that the, the BC Liberals put first. Uh, you know, is the disgraced former cabinet minister or something, right? Uh, you know, that could hurt them in the election, so they wouldn't probably put a disgraced former cabinet minister uh, at the top uh, because that would 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 hurt them. That's somebody who couldn't get elected in a riding, right? Uh, but they might put people on there who, you know, the average voter hasn't heard of either, right? And isn't going to be out actively campaigning all that much either because it's more about how the party does than about how, how they do in terms of their role. But they might be workhorses of the party. Yeah, they, they will be. be. They'll be workhorses of the party, uh, but they'll be real backroom types for the most part, right? They're, they're less likely to be people who have put themselves out there. Uh, that, I mean, you can see advantages to that too. That these are people who are, you know, committed <laughs> policy people, not great at communicating with people in coffee shops, but smart as a button and all that sort of stuff, right? So you know, there's there's advantages and disadvantages. For We've got lots of questions. I want to move on to the last one before we get, but I'll we'll take that one back again. Okay, I was just thinking, if a district vote, would it be fairer to say that you've got a candidate W, X, Y, and Z that may or may not be part of the party in the way you're looking at it, so that they are, in a sense, essentially independent candidates right. who just happen to be a member of the Liberals or the NDP or whatever, and then when you get to the party vote, you're saying, okay, I'm voting for the party, mm -hmm. not for an individual. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what that I tried to fair divide? explain in, in terms of, you know, when you're, sorry, when you're, when you're looking at this ballot as, as a kind of complicated guy that I look like you are, is that you, you know, I like, like I said, I like this candidate because I know them and their family, they're a good person. I can't stand the party, I can't believe he's running for that party. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm happy if that person is our district MLA, right? And then you say, but my real party preference is the other party. And this ballot would allow you to express that kind of complicated um, preference, right? That you could say, you know, I like one candidate, but I like the other party better. Uh, as I said, most candidate, most voters are probably just going to go X, X, you know, match up their, their candidate and party preference. Uh, but this isn't even clear that this would be the form of the ballot we get in the mixed member system. We could have a different style uh, for that as well. We could have one just where it's based on this and they take the share of the party vote based on what happens in this in this district uh, election. But this one's a this one's a more generous presumption. I see lots of hands, but I want to be sure we get through all of them and we're, we're, we're running out. So uh, I'll ask I'll answer any other questions you have, but I want to say uh, something about rural urban as well. And I want to leave at least a minute to talk about first past the post. Um, so the rural urban system uh, is uh, a really a, a kind of strange hybrid. And again, not a, a particularly uh, practice system in other places. Uh, so what it would be is a mixed member, which I just described to you, uh, for the bigger parts of the province. Uh, so the, 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 the sparsely populated ridings that I've talked about a few times. Uh, so single member seats, just like in the mixed member system with some compensatory seats assigned by, uh, by PR. And then for the more urban and what they call semi-urban areas or, or, or suburban <coughs> areas, uh, we would have uh, another system uh, in the category of proportional systems. So here's what ridings would essentially look like with the exception of the large ones. We have a big multi-member riding uh, for for each uh, part of the, the province. So uh, this is more akin to your question earlier. Vancouver would have a like eight person riding because uh, it's a big ride. The North Shore would probably have a big three or four person riding, right? So they would vary in size, uh, but they would be multiple members representing them rather than single members or even dual members representing uh, people in this. And for uh, for the, the especially uh, complicated. Uh, uh, the preference people here, um, you, you have uh, a lot of opportunity to express complex uh, preferences because your ballot is going to look like this one. It's going to be a long list. Uh, Vancouver might have 70 just like it had for City Hall in the, the, the municipal election. Uh, and you can rank them as many 
uh, spaces as that constituency would have. So, uh, you know, the parties are going to run multiple candidates. Uh, this one looks like a four person <coughs> riding. Um, uh, and so, you know, like a candidate, party C has run three people here. Uh, if you're like really loyal to that party, you'll go one, two, three. Uh, but if you want to spread it around, that's perfectly allowed. Uh, and uh, this person has done that in, in this sample ballot. You can give it to all, you can give preferences to all four parties. Uh, the, the counting system for this is uh, kind of get a majority, then your preferences are redistributed uh, to others. It's, it's probably, it's, it's not as complicated as the dual member counting system, but it is a little bit complicated. Uh, but it's, it's essentially a kind of instant runoff. So if you don't get 50%, uh, the, the, low, the, poorest, uh, the poorest person or poorest performing person is dropped and preferences are redistributed uh, based on who gets second place votes, who gets third place votes, uh, and the rest. Yeah. Do, do two, two votes beat a one vote? No, you can only you can only give one, two, three, four. You oh, can't, yeah, you can't give one, one, two. One guy three. gets one one vote. Okay. And the other guy gets two votes as second place. Does he beat? Yeah. So the way it's counted is uh, the first thing that's counted is number one preferences. Yeah, right. So if somebody gets fifty percent of uh, of the number one preferences, they're elected. That's the first thing that's counted, mm -hmm. right? And so then, um, and then and then you go to the the next highest level of number one preferences, uh, except the, uh, the the lowest performing person's dis, uh, preferences are redistributed. So there's their two becomes a, a one to add to others. That's right. yeah. But so two twos, but two twos never beat. So like 40% of twos doesn't beat 50% of ones, right? Yeah, so but if, if number, number one gets 40% 40, 40 of the votes, and the twos get 44% of the votes. So let's get half in this. Right. Okay. But it, it is more like um, the, uh, the leadership uh, balance we've seen Canadian political parties use, where sometimes the sort of third place candidate ends up doing the best uh, because uh, they have more second place preferences than, than the front runner. That's right. And so first past the post uh, is a system that kind of re rewards the person who has, you know, general popularity, uh, but, uh, but you know, in a lot of cases, uh, I mean, given we have two parties of the center left and one party of the center right in, in British Columbia, uh, you know, often uh, the NDP and the, 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 uh, sorry, the federal level, sorry, uh, but often you have two, you know, parties uh, that are sort of on one side of the spectrum and one party on the other, uh, that the second and third place might actually be more popular with people, so that could happen. And that, I mean, Stefan Zion won the, the, the federal liberal leadership that way, right? That he was the second place preference of a lot of people, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, it, but he was a smart political scientist, and that's why he, he did it. He actually campaigned in that direction. That's what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next would be right to say under the rural urban belt, the way that's done. Mm -hmm. Um, because you have multi, you're looking at multiple candidates to vote for. It's, it certainly, I think, is harder on the voting public to try and keep yeah. track of who's a good person or a good party. Yeah, I mean, a good example is, is I mean, you just went through a municipal election. Um, uh, right? Not super clear. If there's not strong parties here in West End, right? But there is sort of some kind of sense of slates. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in Vancouver, it was more complicated because the parties weren't running full slates and all that sort of stuff. So in Vancouver, they had 71 <coughs> candidates for 10 council seats. Uh, and then a whole bunch of them were independents. Others were with one party and then not with the parties. And so, you know, the, the information uh, requirements of voters is quite high. Uh, but the reason this was preferred by the BCSTV, by the Citizens Assembly, is because it kind of neutered parties a little bit. It made these candidates a bit more independent of their parties, right? It didn't, there's so, certainly no list in this system, right? The party candidates could push back against their parties a little bit and say, you know, I'm a popular MLA, it's not because of your party that I, and so they might, we might see a different dynamic in the legislature. But this would only be for about 80% of the province, right? The other 20% would have that other system. So it's essentially two systems in one. We got a question in the back of that. I'll take yours. Yeah. Can you still report who gets first, second, and third? Doesn't it not really matter? Because it'll be, it's 
Um, yeah, so that, I mean, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, since I've been at, in British Columbia, I've done about a dozen election nights at, uh, in the radio. Yeah, I love doing it. It's my favorite thing I get to do apart from teaching. Uh, and, uh, but we're always like, who's going to win? And it's like, you know, at 9 o'clock, and then we have to say at 10 o'clock, and you know, da -da -da -da, you know, decided that uh, we have to all that drama will be gone because it's going to take like a couple of days to count a lot of them, because right? uh, they have to go through and redistribute preferences and so on. So uh, there will be, uh, it might put me out of a job as an election night analyst, and I will hate them forever because uh, right? it'll be in there. So because, you know, you know, when you watch them, they're like, well, early results, early results. It'll be like two days of us saying early results, but it looks like, because uh, it does take longer to, to, to count them. Right, but I think I mean I think they would that you know who the first okay. who won on first preferences perhaps like somebody who's most popular in second, third, and fourth uh, they would kind of rank them that way as the first seats that are filled in the multi-member district. Yeah, so you would have a sense of the popularity, uh, and you know I think that would be relevant information for politicians too. So, yeah. Is this system being used anywhere? So the STV does um, uh, and MMP do, but never the two together, right? So this is. This is a weird hybrid um, that, remember my first point on the first slide? We got a weird province, <laughs> and that's what it's compensating for, right? Uh, you know, so many of the countries where PR is in use are relatively small, I mean, are comparatively small. I mean, many of the countries are smaller than the province of BC uh, and have higher populations than the province of BC, so they're denser. Uh, and so this problem is not, like Israel has a single constituency. Right, it's just one constituency uh, with a, a single list, and you work down the list. Um, uh, that that brings another all kinds of other dynamics that people don't like, but uh, but it works because it's a densely populated, quite small place. Right? Um, uh, Norway uses a form of PR, but you know they have equally uninhabited parts of the of the, the country, but not even close to as as inhabited as ours are. They're barely. You know, it's the Arctic, so they don't have. So, still, most of the population is in urban areas, uh, and it works, uh, you know, that way. But this is coping with that. that, that. I think I have to do the back there. I, I see the logic of redistributing the votes of the candidate who falls off the ballot. Right. But what's the rationale for redistributing the extra votes of the candidate who, who gets more than fifty percent? Um, so, I think it's. It's partly about the way. So I, I may have misdescribed it. I mean, you, you have to you have to get to, to four in this case, right? So so when you, you have the first preferences counted, um, and then and then you do have to drop someone. So you take the you take the preferences of the, the dropped candidate in, yeah. in their second. So that's how you do it. I, I'm not actually sure that if I suggested uh, that the, the winners. No, but that's what it says in the booklet. Does it? Yeah. That they gave us. Yeah. Um, if an elected candidate has more votes than the then quota, the threshold, their yeah. extra votes are transferred to other right. candidates. Yeah. And I don't understand that. Yeah, so you just have to meet a threshold, which is the the uh, the, the percentage uh, to to uh, there's a quotient, right? You have to beat be, yeah, be the quotient, uh, and so your extra per preference. I mean, it's it's a it's it's in the category of making every vote count, right? So that if somebody gets ninety percent of, of the preferences, uh, that you know that there's still some there's some information in the, these ballots that we can use to get a more proportional result, right? I think that's that's the logic. But which votes are the extra votes? Um, so uh, I mean, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you take which percentage? Uh, it's it's not entirely clear to me. Actually, that's a good question. I mean. I'm not an expert on STV, so uh, that's that, that's my defense on this one. Uh, but but it is but it is it's not super clear how you pick those seats. That's right. On the ballot, on the ballot itself, are the candidates listed alphabetically or by party? Um, you have different ways to do it. The way they did it in um, in Vancouver this last time uh, would be an example. Is random. Uh, so, right, so they drew names, and that's where you ended up on the ballot. Uh, because there is political science research that suggests 
no, uh, being the first few that's right. it helps. That's, that's right. um, so uh, it's not alphabetical. Yeah, so it wouldn't be alphabetical. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it, I don't think it makes as big a difference in our typical first past the post selection where you have four or five candidates because um, uh, you can see the whole list. But when you get to 60 and 70, well, even, there, it's even there, it seems like a lot, yeah. Uh, and again, that makes it challenging, right? Because, um, you know, I was encouraging a lot of people who were going to go vote in Vancouver. There was a website tool you could go on and look at all the candidates and say, I like these four. And they would actually give you a map as to where they were on that big ballot of 71. It was this big, right? It was, it was uh, and so, uh, you know, to save time in the polling place, it was a good idea to do that bit of homework because otherwise you'd be like, what was his last name again? Oh, yeah. And you know, I can imagine the, the couples fighting and all the rest of it. <laughs> they, they could, uh, you know, so you could take a cheat sheet in with you if you wanted to, to, to be able to do that. Do you have to pick four? No, you can you can express like one single, and then if you if you're worried about redistributed, you know, you don't like twos, uh, you can just pick one and that's it. You know, so and that's true also of this referendum ballot. If you only like one of the PR systems, rank it one and forget about the rest. You don't have to put the others on. You don't have to rank any more than one. Uh, I heard, and I think it's in the information provided to us, that at uh, a later date, at a certain date after the next election, there would be another referendum to allow us to decide if this is, or allow people to decide, yep. is this going to continue or not. And then I, I read something that a commentator said that they felt that this was not defined in any legislation to guarantee that it would happen. Yeah, so you're, you're close. Yeah, so, so yeah, so 2020, the, the present legislation is bringing in this referendum. So the referendum, the Electoral Reform Referendum Act, or whatever it's called, um, has this provision that in 2029, the provincial election in 2029, which is two cycles from now, we would revisit the question of whether to have this. Uh, so it is in the legislation yeah, right now. Okay. Um, but uh, what the commentators are saying is that if there's a change of government, uh, they could they could repeal that legislation, right? They could take it out, um, or you know the same government could keep repeal the legislation. Nothing can. Uh, it's a kind of basic constitutional fact that you can't stop the legislature from doing things, uh, changing the laws. Otherwise, we'd still have like all kinds of terrible laws that we've had forever, right? So you can't bind future legislatures. Uh, the presumption is that that would be a pretty risky strategy uh, on any go government's part to say, oh, it was, we promised that you'd get to revisit this in two elections, but eh, we don't like that idea anymore. Uh, so I think that would, it's probably still likely happen, but it would be in 2029, uh, the sort of two elections after the next one, uh, you'd have the chance to sort of, do we like this or do we want to go back to the old one? Uh, which is actually, uh, I mean, process-wise, might be the nicest part of the process in terms of making a credible commitment to reviewing this down the line. Right? So, uh, and it would be a simple, the same simple majority as this. Yep. Um, we spent a lot of time tonight talking about mechanisms. Right. Do you have any observations on... Results? <laughs> the results and yeah. the harsh training that goes on, the policy compromises, and Merkel spent two months trying to form a government, and things in Italy, you read about Scandinavia, so yeah. it seems there's more chaos at the end of it all. Yeah. Um, I will be able to ask, answer that question if I say my little bit about first past the post because um, so this is the system we have now, right? I mean, we shouldn't go without talking about its strengths and weaknesses also. Uh, its priority is definitely on local representation. That's what you're familiar with. That's what you're kind of, it's partly the lens you're looking through these other systems through, I, I sense, uh, just from the questions and the, the concerns you have. Um, what it tends to do, and this gets to results, is it, it encourages parties to seek something in the middle, right? Because you want to, it, not quite lowest common denominator, that's not exactly the way you would say it, but you're looking for an average voter to support, right? And you need to have sort of 40%. You can't get away with smaller than that, uh, and it'd be better if you could have more than that. So parties, uh, that also tends to limit the effective number of parties. We've seen a lot of parties come and go here in British Columbia. Uh, you know, if you, if you don't think the BC Liberals are conservative enough, you're out of luck, really. Uh, you know, the Conservative Party, the Socred Party, they kind of flash and they go away, right? Uh, if you want to vote Green, you can, uh, and the Greens are doing better here than anywhere else in the country, but it, the system doesn't really give them a real entree uh, into, into power. Um, 
Uh, so districts tend to be volatile in this version because, you know, 41, 42, go back and forth, uh, it, it can make a big change. The outcome of that is that we tend to have governments that, that go in pretty different directions from one another, right? Uh, you know, they, they, they have a different tone, uh, they, they repeal some of the laws of, of the previous government and so on. Uh, but once elected, they're quite stable, so when in place, they have a lot of opportunity to, to, to do stuff uh, over their four-year term, right? Uh, they will not, they don't face the sort of checks and balances that even uh, Donald Trump is going to face over the next two years because they have uh, these strong legislative majorities and they're able to, to pass uh, a lot going on. Uh, but the first pass the post system definitely has a lot of capacity for wasted votes, Green Party, so on, uh, and uh, for false or inflated majorities. So, you know, 43% of the vote can give you 60% of the seats in the legislature. And as you will hear opponents of first pass the post say, 100% of the pound, right? Because if you've got a majority in the legislature, you're essentially uh, making all the decisions because our parties are quite strongly disciplined in Canada uh, and, and able to do that. So all proportional systems are going to lead to some undermining of, of both this party seeking in the middle uh, and, um, and uh, the, the limiting on the effective number of parties, right? Uh, most proportional systems have a threshold of 5% or so uh, to be recognized in the proportional system. So the truly fringe don't usually have success, you know, like uh, the jackbooted thugs or whatever. Uh, that, that tends not to be, uh, you know, more than 5%. Uh, but, uh, but more particular uh, kinds of uh, ideologies can thrive uh, in the system, and uh, the parties that we're familiar with are likely to fragment a little bit, right? Um, uh, they're likely to be, I mean, right now the BC Liberals do have a kind of more conservative element and a more sort of centrist element. They're essentially line up on people who are old social credit and people who are federal liberals uh, are together in this party right now. Uh, that might not be able to hold in a, in a PR type system because they can both see where they could have a leader and 20% of the popular vote, right, and they would go that way. So the result in most PR legislatures is more coalitions, more need for compromise. Uh, some people see that as a, a benefit because you have to find ways to compromise over the long term. Um, uh, that's certainly the way that they would characterize, say, the kind of PR style of, of Scandinavian countries and so on. Uh, but, you know, we can't put down all of the democratic success of, of Northern Europe to proportional representation. Either. These are relatively homogeneous, uh, wealthy places. They are going to have pretty good democracy anyway. It's not just because they have uh, PR. So we can't make that kind of error of, you know, uh, correlation and causation, right? <laughs> it's not, they're not like that. But there certainly will be more trading, uh, you know, it will be less clear on election night, uh, in part because it takes longer to count, but even after you've counted, uh, it's not clear where things are going to fall. Um, you know, we get that a little bit in our system right now because we have more than two parties, uh, right? So, uh, you know, uh, New Brunswick is the latest example. Uh, after us here in BC, uh, they elected two, the two major old parties, uh, but there were three, three M MLAs for a new New Brunswick only party uh, and three MLAs for the Green Party, and that's changing. Uh, the government fell right last week, so uh, the, the previous government tried, just like the BC Liberals did, uh, and now it's not clear it's like where that coalition is going to go, uh, and, and that sort of stuff is going to happen. So that that kind of stability and and simpleness of result uh, is definitely out the window with PR, but people see that as potentially an advantage. So um, before I stop for the last questions, I gave you this handout with this other uh, thing on it about uh, electoral values. Um, and so I, I just wanted you to think, when you go back to think about uh, what you like about uh, different systems, this is my proposal uh, for the way uh, that you should think about it. If you don't like wasted votes, uh, SMP is not going to be for you. This is, I'm just trying to walk you through a couple of examples. Uh, all three of the systems are better at dealing with that. So that's not going to be the only uh, uh, variable or value uh, you think about. If you like complex preferences, PR, FTPT is not very good for you either. These all allow for a little bit more complexity in your expression. Um, I, actually, I put a little bit more in there based on the way that they drew the, the ballot uh, as well. Uh, diverse parties, 
uh, all more likely under uh, the, the systems that we're talking about because uh, that need or that imperative to, to have a big tent, as we sometimes describe it, uh, in, in our single member system is going to be less uh, present. Right? There's going to be more opportunity to get elected uh, representing a, a, a less kind of centrist uh, point of view. Uh, my favorite was always, I grew up in Alberta, as I said, I moved to the big city, I grew up in a small town, I moved to Calgary, and I lived in the downtown riding, and I was shocked at my first election um, that there were like four different communist parties in the downtown riding in Calgary. Uh, there's like the Marxist, Leninists, the communists, uh, the Leninists, and the Trotskyists, and I was like, I can't believe those people who are going to get like 1% of the vote in downtown Calgary anyway couldn't get together uh, and have one uh, candidate, but they had these ideological differences, right? Well, I'm not communist, but I'm not a Leninist. Crying out loud, you know. And you're not going to get elected. So good news on that one, too. Uh, uh, but but we, we, we did introduce a little bit of that dynamic, right? That, that people who had, uh, you know, maybe compromise to be part of a big party would have less reason to do that because they could still see themselves easily getting 5% of the vote. You know, it's all those systems would do that. Um, constituency size is pretty straightforward from what I described to you. Uh, diversity of candidates. Uh, uh, the, the different systems are probably going to give you more opportunity for that. Uh, uh, dual member systems, for example, uh, it would be almost inconceivable <laughs> that parties would run two male candidates on their, their list, uh, but the question of where they put their preference, the, who is a primary and who is secondary, would be a different one. But in almost all dual member systems, can, parties would run one female, one male in every uh, every constituency. Whether they get both seats would be a different question. Um, right now, in our first past the post system, to have diversity of candidates is really up to the parties, and they tend to mirror the diversity of the constituency itself, right? So. Uh, the, the Indo-Canadian candidates that we see successful in the Lower Mainland are in South Vancouver and places where Indo-Canadians have a larger presence in the population. Uh, likewise, uh, you know, Chinese candidates in Richmond and so on. And the parties recognize that and they, 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 they're running candidates uh, that, that fit that. Uh, but it's up to the parties in our SNP system right now. Uh, party control, probably likely higher in all three uh, of the systems. Uh, stable and energetic government, your question, less likely in all three PR systems, likely to get a bit more instability, maybe a little bit more chaos. Uh, and the role of party professionals, that's what pros means. Uh, you know, fewer pros in the SNP system, possibly more, uh, likely more, and so on. Uh, if you're thinking about those as, as variables. So you can kind of think about what your preferences would be and do a little mini citizens assembly <laughs> if you want uh, with that and, and see where you line up uh, and when you approach your ballot remember you, you can rank these three I rank all three I can help myself uh, but you don't have to rank all three you can rank one uh, or, or, or rank none uh, and uh, so that, but if you vote no if you say you don't want PR you're still allowed to rank these as well. so what's on the December the first Everybody's going right. to count it. Yeah. First past the post, people said, we like it. Yeah. That's the end of the story. We're done, yeah. yeah we're done. First past the post, no, we like the PR. And then what happens? Then we get into this, do, which do is the first. Do they have to pick one of these? Do they actually have to make a, or? Yeah, we're gonna, they're going to use the, the, the so rank preference. So we're going to end up having one of those three? Yes. How do you break a tie? <laughs> Well, it's a it's a rank ballot, so that it'll, it'll work. And twenty seven percent of the population voted. Yeah, and this is a your question before so we started. Fifteen percent of the population plus one. Yep. Says we're going to get one. Of these. So I told you I had some problems with the process. I think it's a little bit flawed. Uh, that's part of what I think is a little bit flawed. About it. I mean, uh, I mean, the the preference, the alternative is that nothing. We have we don't have a constitution in British Columbia that says the legislature couldn't just do this anyway, right? So, I mean, this is more consultative uh, than that. 15% uh, of the population of BC is still better than 87 MLAs. But, but at the same time, I think, you know, our standard could be higher. <laughs> we could expect more. So it will be disappointing if 20% or 30% of eligible voters do it. Uh, you know, we don't have a lot to go on right now. Elections BC is saying what's happened so far. Uh, not a lot have been turned in. Uh, about 1% of the ballots have been returned. Uh, but mine's still on my kitchen table. I imagine yours is too. Um, uh, but we've also seen, I've seen lots of pictures on Twitter of apartment buildings with 
recycling bins full of them as well. So, uh, so it's hard to know. Fifty percent plus one of ballots turned in. Right. And, it and no requirements that we have to have a certain turnout rate. Yeah. Is the one that they do they have to pick the one that gets fifty plus one? Well, because it's ranked, they'll 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 they'll, they'll so redistribute preferences so that you get based on what the so that's that's why I'm a political scientist. I couldn't help but like rank all three because I was like, well, I do have a preference, but I want to make sure that my third place what preference isn't the second what one. What if nobody get? What if none of them get fifty percent? It will because it'll be redistributed. So the the one that comes in last will get their preferences. Yeah. Just to clarify, if, if you if you want to vote for first past the post, yep. you just mark it and that's it. You don't have to do anything with. You don't it. have to do anything else, but you can. I, I've had people tell me that I, I'm also supposed to fill in. The you can, or you, or you don't have to. And you can actually leave the. As I understand it, you can leave the first part blank and just rank in the second part if you want. Uh, uh, but I can't see why anyone would do that. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I can see why you would, you could vote no and still want to rank. You know what happens if you know you get still your out of a part. If we gotta have it, I want this one. Yeah, yeah. But if, and if you just if you want first past the post, you just mark first past the post yeah. Yeah. and leave it. You can leave it that too. Just leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. I have a question about rural urban. Yeah. Do the rural areas have the same amount of seats as the urban areas, or is it? A no, it would be it would be based largely on the kind of relative ratio now, but they'd be using that MMP system in in the rural areas and then the STD uh, in the in the urban areas. I, the reason why you don't have, you can't just have an STV across the province is that uh, the, the ridings for the, the least dense parts of the province would have to be so big to even get two. Um, and, and you know, so you're not getting, you're not, you're not replicating that STV option for the north. Uh, and so they're trying to have a more proportional system there. Uh, I mean, the reality is that right now, uh, you know, our, our less dense parts of the province are overrepresented. Uh, I don't think they're they're um, they're critically overrepresented, but they are overrepresented because it's challenging to overrepresent them. It's a it's an accepted sort of value of Canadian democracy that's true uh, across the country in every, every province, and it's true in our federal system as well. Right, the PEI has four seats. Uh, you know, the, the whole province of PEI is smaller than the West Vancouver Sea to Sky country population in terms of eligible voters. Right, but they got four times as many votes. Do, does the four seats that the, the province of PEI have in the Parliament of Canada uh, mean much? Not really. In 338, it's not even one percent of, of the seats, right? So it's it's uh, it's, it's uh, you know it doesn't critically overrepresent them, but it gives them a sense of belonging that's a little bit different. What about bigger. recalls? What about recalls? Yeah. Are we going to be able to recall people if we don't want Yeah, them? so I mean, uh, all the district ones, uh, I guess the, the present recall system would still be in place, uh, but there would it would be hard to see that for, in, say, for example, in the MMP system, uh, to be able to recall a party list uh, person because of the, the, unless they did it at the regional level or something, that would be, I mean, that said, we haven't recalled anybody in PC. We threatened to and scared a few of them, but uh, never including like usually the first person to get a recall petition against them is the leader of the party that brings in recall which is uh, true historically as well William Aberhart brought in recall legislation in Alberta and the first recall petition was against William Aberhart <laughs> didn't succeed uh, but he decided that it wasn't such a good idea yeah. there's a theoretical question this five percent as a minimum for yep. the uh, multi-member uh, where did that five percent come from Oh, and is it, would 10% be better or is it? Well, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think uh, some th some PR systems have a lower threshold. 3%, I think, has been some cases. 10% um, would seem a little bit high, uh, frankly, like in terms of if you're trying to make a more proportional system. Uh, you know, there's lots of parties that have in, been in that 6 to 7% uh, area. Uh, and six to seven percent in our in our legislature would be four or five seats, and that seems a reasonable number in terms of you know an expression of points of view in, in the province uh, that would be worth uh, having. So I, I'm, there's no I don't think there's there's no scientific basis for picking five over three over ten, uh, but five does tend to to limit the the more extreme uh, for sure. Uh, it's it's probably a conservative like a cautious. Uh, 
a threshold to have. If you had a 2% threshold, you might see a little more extremism possible. Um, but 5% is sort of erring on the side of caution, I think. Just increase the size of government. Um, so it wouldn't increase the size of government, it would increase the size of the legislature. I think all three of the proposed systems would add possibly as much as 10% to the size of the legislature right now. Um, uh, because the math is kind of hard with 87, and so uh, to, to make these proportionals, and it would vary from election to election. Uh, so we would have a minimum amount as what we have now at 87, uh, and then the compensatory seats of different systems would add where necessary, so as many as 95 in, in most of the cases. Um, and, and the range is pretty much in that for all three of the proposed systems. Are um, they paid differently? No, they, I mean, so they'd be, it would add 10% to the cost of the, the legislature. Yeah. But we do that now. Um, if you recall from my first slide, we had 79 MLAs in, in 2005, we have 87 now. We add to keep the population ratio roughly uh, the same as, as it is now. Uh, so uh, on the basis of every 10-year census, we redistribute seats and we try to keep the, but we usually add because we're growing, right? So um, yeah, trust me, I lived in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, this is a problem we want to have. We're growing. Um, you know, when, when your population is not growing, you don't have to add seats to the legislature, there's usually there's usually prob other problems that go along with that. So I, I, I'd be happy to take that over you know, stagnant growth in a province where they haven't changed the size of the legislature for years. Yeah, 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 the, the system will add a few. Um, and it's, it's likely uh, that that would continue, although you could see a size where they could get to where they wouldn't need to actually add as many at the next census because we have enough in the system. I haven't heard way the back. We talked a lot this evening around how we exercise, how we would in each of these models exercise our ability to vote right. and select people. Um, and it sounds like the dual member um, model hasn't been tested yet. Right. It's made in Canada. I'm curious from a political scientist point of view, which model do you think would be the most effective to govern? Because when I'm making my, right. when I'm voting, I'm not just voting for how I would exercise my right yeah. to vote. I'm also wanting to think about the cost of my government, the effectiveness of my government, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I mean, the sort of most straightforward answer is that you know one of the things that we that the first past the post system does relatively well is you know if there's a like sort of basically a consensus in the country or the province, uh, it can be expressed uh, and government can go ahead and just do all that stuff, right? Uh, if we don't like it, we can switch it uh, and they can go ahead and do a bunch of stuff too, right? Um, some people see that as a weakness, uh, others see it as a strength of our system, right? Is that we can, we can make relatively stark choices and push them through. Um, you know, the, the Scandinavian argument is you want to develop consensus over time. So it really is about, it's up to you how you want to see consensus uh, done. Is it a kind of consensus over the long term that we get to by, by pushing back and forth on each other, or is it one that you can kind of keep stable over a longer period of time? And, and the PR systems will, will get you uh, more in that direction. If you, if you like a government that makes bold choices and that you can either reward or punish for, First past the post is still a pretty good one for that because it, it gives them, you know, a pretty good buffer to be able to go ahead and push uh, things through. Uh, you know, what happens in in more proportional systems is they tend to have to compromise more uh, with other parties. Uh, but if you think of the big policy uh, changes in Canada that people historically point to as, you know, great Canadian government things, they tend to come out of minority governments. So, you know, we have Medicare because of minority government, not because of a majority government. Although, uh, having a majority in the legislature helps you keep it. But, um, so it's, it's hard to, to say for sure. That's a, it's a good thing to think about. The tyranny of the minority. Sorry? The tyranny of the minority. The tyranny of the minority. I mean, well, I mean, that's what some people are concerned about. I mean, right now, uh, you know, in, I'm conscious of time, uh, we have a three-member Green Caucus that is essentially, you know, propping up a minority, uh, and so there's a lot of power for those three, and, and most PR systems 
would have you have a small party have at least some power to dictate over larger parties to keep their consent, right? And so that, that, that's certainly possible in, in PR systems. I'm way over time. But uh, thanks for all the wonderful questions. I hope we've got some clear. Tonight, as, as uh, you may know, uh, the two party leaders are debating this on television, uh, and so this will be, this is interesting because one of the flaws of 2005 was that, I mean flaws, uh, was that there wasn't really a strong sense of where parties lined up on support or lack of support for uh, the system. Uh, this time around, uh, the, the two parties, the government opposition parties, have very strong positions, right? So uh, Andrew Wilkinson, the, the PC Liberal leader, is very much keeping first past the post, uh, and John Horgan is, is enthusiastic enough about PR. He hasn't said, I don't think, what system he likes, uh, but they will be debating it on TV tomorrow night so for a half an hour. So you want to, you, you have to at 7 o'clock. Uh, what channel? CBC and Globe. Yeah, they're both broadcasting. And if anybody's still there with the program survey, you can drop it up there and drop it up later, anywhere.